live here at BCA Studios. I'm joined here with Kevin Tocci. Kevin, thanks for being here. You got it. Busy night tonight in, uh, in candidate land, so to speak. Uh, WATD and BCA teaming up together. We have the eight candidates for a city councilor at large in the November 3rd election. These are the eight finalists that came from the preliminary election to today. And uh, earlier tonight, we drew the ballot order for opening and closing statements. And we're going to start first for a minute with uh, Councilor Moses Rodriguez. Sure. Good evening, and, and thank you, BCA, and thank you, uh, WATD, for doing this. Uh, my fellow Brocktonians, um, I'm here tonight to ask you uh, to afford me another opportunity to serve you as a counselor for another two years. I had the honor and privilege of being elected almost two years ago, and it's been truly a pleasure. Uh, it's been a pleasure because it has allowed me to go into City Hall and do my best to represent you, the voters in this community. We have some serious issues in the city, uh, but what's important is that we remember that Brockton is a city. We're not Avon South. We're not some community just south of Boston. We are a city, and the cities have problems, but they're problems that could be resolved. Uh, it could be resolved by working together as a unit, together with law enforcement and the community themselves to, um, to work to resolve these issues, but they're issues nevertheless. We've got plenty of problems. But I count on you to send me back for the next two years to help uh, resolve the problems here in the city of Brockton. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Uh, next up uh, in the drawing is Craig Pina. Good evening. I want to thank Brockton Community Access and uh, WATD with uh, Kevin Tachi here uh, for holding this, this forum. Uh, my name is Craig Pina, and once again, I'm here to ask for your vote for Councilor at Large in the city of Brockton. We're going to hear tonight, uh, we have eight candidates, including myself, who all care about the future of the city of Brockton. Uh, what we, what we, 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 task, we task you with, the voter, is determining which candidate best will serve the city of Brockton to progress into the future, to help develop our economic opportunities in the city of Brockton, to help make Brockton a safe place, to help to make Brockton a better place to raise your family and, and grow your business. Uh, I will humbly ask you over the course of the night to, uh, to cast your vote for me, Craig Pina, for Councilor at Large for the City of Brockton. Thank you, Craig. And next up in, in order of appearance is Wynn Farwell. Uh, good evening to all of you watching at home. Thank you to BCA for sponsoring this debate. For 10 years I served on the school committee and for four years I served as mayor. I was elected mayor the year after Brockton was almost bankrupt and we laid off 20 percent of our workforce including firefighters, police officers and teachers. It's going to take someone with experience, management experience, experience with municipal finance and public safety to address the many challenges that we have here in Brockton. My number one priority is public safety. We simply cannot allow the proliferation of shootings and the amount of crime that's occurring to continue. We will frighten people away from the city. We will frighten people from coming to the city. And most of all, we have to make sure that our streets and neighborhoods are safe for children who walk home from school. So I ask your consideration and I ask you to evaluate all of us based on our qualifications and our experience and just ask the question, who will best be prepared to lead Brockton forward and address these challenges? Thank you very much. Thank you, Wynn. Uh, next would be Susan Castro. Thank you, Mark, Kevin, and everyone here for the opportunity to speak. Good evening, Brockton. I'm Susan Castro. I was delighted as a first-time political candidate to place fifth a few weeks ago in the preliminary election, fifth out of 13. And I, I ask, I, I'd be honored to, to obtain your vote on November 3rd. Um, I have the training, the experience, the passion, and the vision to be a, a counselor at large here in Brockton. I've been an attorney for 30 years. Um, I've, I'm a real estate and business attorney. I review contracts all the time. Um, I'm, I just finished five years on the Brockton Planning Board and two years on the Zoning Board of Appeals. So I understand from those years how the city works, how city government works. Um, I, I know the whole city because of that experience. And I have 16 years of volunteer at the Charity Guild in Brockton. So I'm familiar with the needs of, of our less fortunate uh, friends and neighbors. I'm number six on the ballot, six for Susan, and I'd love your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next would be Gary Keith. 
Good evening. I want to thank BCA for uh, adjusting this, holding this forum for us tonight. And um, basically, I'm coming before you tonight, and I'm asking you for your vote in, the, in this general election. My name is Gary Keith. My family live here, resides for 25 years here in the city of Brockton. I've been serving the public for over 40 years in some capacity or another, uh, taking my military background and everything else. So I am a U.S. Army veteran. I have a law background. I currently sit on the planning board and the zoning board of appeals here for the city of Brockton. I do have what it takes to drive the passion, the knowledge for the, over the past two years of working with a lot of the uh, different agencies that have come in front of the planning board and the zoning board to help move this city forward. I look forward to your vote. I ask you humbly for your vote. And I ask you to help put the team together in City Hall that's actually going to work together to move us out of the chaos that we have right now that's going on in our streets, someone that can address the public safety and can bring some new business into our city for revenue and can push us forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next would be Adias Pierre. Good evening. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kevin, for having me tonight for this forum. Worked on. Good evening. My name is Adrius Pierre. I'm here tonight to let you know I have been living in this city for more than 20 years. I'm a parent. My, my kids go to public school in Brockton. I'm very worried about the safety of my kids. That's why I'm here. I have the skill, the training required to make Brockton safe. Please, on November 3rd, give me a chance to serve you. And I will use all my assets, all my training, all my skill to make Brockton a better place. The problem will not be solved with one person. It will take a team. And I'm a team player. I can work with anybody to make sure we have a better Brockton. On November 3rd, please consider to give me your vote, and I will be a servant to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arius. Uh, next would be Shana Barnes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for hosting this uh, candidates forum. Thank you, candidates, my colleagues in government and friends. Um, welcome. Hello, and, and the distinguished dais, and everyone here in the studio. My name is Shana Barnes, and I currently serve as one of your four counselors at large. I will be number one on the ballot on, in November, and I humbly ask for your vote. I'm not going to get into uh, my qualifications at this particular time. At the end of this forum, I will come back before you, and I will lay out very clearly and cogently why I feel that I should earn your vote. So again, my name is Shana Barnes, city counselor at large, city of Brockton. I will be number one in November. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. And uh, Robert Sullivan. Good evening. Uh, thank you again, Mark and Kevin. And uh, I want to just thank those that are watching this tonight or will watch it in the future. My name is Robert Sullivan, and I proudly stand here today as a concert at large for the last 10 years serving the entire city, all seven wards, all 28 precincts. And again, I'm putting my name out there, uh, and I'm asking for your vote on November 3 to reelect me. Uh, I think when you look at uh, over the 10 years what I've done, I think I've been an advocate at all times for the residents, the city employees, the seniors, uh, and, and ultimately you. Uh, I'm your voice. When I knock on your door, and I was doing it today in Ward 7D, uh, people say, why do you keep this up, Bob? Because Brockton's home, and I think that uh, you know, my mission as a city councilor hasn't been concluded yet. I want to continue to work with my colleagues, uh, all 11 of us on the city council, to make your lives better, make your children's lives better. It's our community, and it's our home, and again, I, I respectfully ask you to vote on November 3. Uh, September 22nd was preliminary, and you honored me with over 5,000 votes, uh, but it's a new day. And again, Robert Sullivan, I'm going to be number three on the ballot, but I'm always first for Brockton. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Everybody kept to the time, and I appreciate it. Um, it's a lot to say with eight people all in the room all at the same time. We're going to start with the questions, and I'm going to do something completely out of the ordinary. I'm going to start from that side and go this way, and then we're going to mix it up as we go along. Kevin has the first question. I just want to first to say it's an it's a honor and a privilege to be able to ask you guys these questions that I have prepared on behalf of the folks uh, of the city of Brockton. Uh, first question I want to ask is, is what is the role of an at-large counselor, and uh, what do you see your role as being a member of the city council? I think that's kind of important because I think everybody will have a different answer. So we'll start with Craig. 
That is a great question. People ask me that question all the time. They say, what is the role of a city council? And there's a difference between the role of a ward councilor and an at-large councilor as, as I see it. Uh, as an at-large councilor, I see a lot of, a lot of an at-large councilor's responsibility to work, to work with, with residents, again, in addition to the ward councilors, but also to work with businesses trying to, trying to set up roots in the city, to attract new businesses, to attract new investors to the city. That's why my, my focus will be on business investment in the city. Again, I'm working with, with some individuals to develop a community development uh, corporation for downtown Brockton and the areas around our three train stations to develop the economic activity around that area. I've, 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 I've reached out to the business community. I've been a member of the business com community for over 20 years in the city of Brockton. Uh, so that's, that's where I feel that I'm qualified. And that's what I think the, the role of a counselor at large can really be played uh, to the most effect. Thank you. Uh, next would be Adias. Same question <coughs> from Kevin. Thank you. Well, as a council at large, I, I believe we all almost have the same duty and responsibility for the city. The only difference is that I have to work for the whole city. In general, people all over the city can vote for me. And city council at word, if you don't live in that section, some people cannot vote for you. But the way I see, I see it in a bigger, better, uh, bigger picture. We need to work on the budget for the city to make sure the money goes where it's supposed to. I heard so many complaints about money being taken away from the school, go to other department. So I believe that our duty, our job, to work together with the mayor and to make sure our world, our children in school got the after school program, they got sports. Everybody in the city got a fair share as a resident. So. I believe when I elected as a councilor at, work, at large, I will work with everybody to make sure we have a good budget for Brockton and make sure Brockton has the security they deserve, police officers, fire department, ambulance, ev everything to work as a team. Again, I will work with everyone as a city councilor at large, not only work, but everyone. Thank you. Just to reiterate the question, especially for those who are just tuning in now. In your opinion, what is the, the role of an at-large council and what do you see your role being on the city council? The role of a city councilor is to represent the entire city. Um, the ward councilors in many ways have it much easier. They can focus within their wards. There are four at-large councilors whose jobs it is to look at city issues. Um, to attend all the other ward councilors' meetings, as they may be. Um, so many of the issues that affect our city today are citywide. Opioid addiction and the ramifications to our city, education, um, the well-being of our seniors, um, how our tax revenue is used. These are citywide issues um, that I will, that are part of my agenda and that I will spend an awful lot of time on. Perhaps the one of greatest concern is crime and public safety. And this afternoon there was a shooting in Campello in Ward 4 that is affecting um, the entire city because these shootings are happening everywhere. Um, and that is what an at-large counselor cares about. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, <coughs> Gary Keith. Thank you. The role of a counselor at large, basically, in my opinion, is to back up some of the seven ward councils also to reinforce what they uh, are doing in their communities, to go out and serve every citizen in Brockton, but also to approve budgets, um, to watch where all our fiscal spending is going. But it also, as a former business owner or as a business owner, basically I had to knock on a lot of doors when I was going out uh, attracting businesses for Boston East Security Corporation. And I think that is the same thing that a city council or I would do as a city councilor at large, that I would continue to knock on businesses, business doors of all the Fortune 500 companies in the state of Massachusetts and outside of the state of Massachusetts to see if we couldn't attract them into our city to create more revenue um, here and to get them just to see what Brockton has to offer if they were to come into Brockton and do business with us. So I think that would be one of the roles uh, that I would do as a city councilor at large. Um, Again, I feel that my personality and the experience that I do bring uh, would actually work with any of the uh, city councils that are already sitting there, all the other ten actually. So um, I feel that I would be a good fit and I'm looking forward to your vote on November 3rd. Thank you. 
Okay, next, uh, Wynn Firewell. Ken, the question is, what is the role of an at-large councilor, in your opinion, and what role do you see yourself as being as a member of the City Council? Well, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, City Councilors at large are members of the legislative body of the City. There are 11 councilors. In particular, the councilors at large run in all of the 28 precincts, all of the seven wards, and you need to be accessible and listen to all of your constituents in all 28 precincts and seven wards. But more than that, when an issue arises in Ward 6 or Ward 3 or Ward 4, you then form a partnership with the ward councilor. And then both of you get to work on an issue. Both of you research and analyze what is the best course of action. What should we do to make the lives of our residents in that particular area better? And then collectively, all of us have to review the mayor's budget. Uh, it's, it's a monumental task to review that type of a spending plan. We approve the uh, appropriation, but we cannot add to it, and so financial management becomes a very important part of all 11 city councilors, whether you're a ward councilor or a councilor at large. Thank you. Uh, Robert Sullivan? Well, thank you. And for those watching, uh, again, there are seven ward councilors and there's four of us that serve the entire city as councilors at large. Uh, what, what I've done for 10 years is I've worked in collaboration. Uh, there's, there's power in numbers. And I've always worked with each individual ward councilor. And what I've said when I go to the ward meetings is you have your respective ward councilor, and then any given day you have another four people that will go to bat for you. So um, that's what a councilor at large does. You're the voice for the entire city of Brock, and you work hand-in-hand uh, -hand with your colleagues on the city council, all 11 of us. And we do, uh, you know, look at the budget. We do appropriations. We're also the legislative branch. Um, you also sit as a chair of a committee. I've been elected twice city council. Council President, uh, and I also uh, have served as chair of the Finance Committee, and that's very, very important for the day to day operations of the City of Brockton. But also, right now, I chair the Ordinance Committee, uh, creating laws that affect your daily lives. Uh, I've created ordinances and laws that benefit seniors and veterans by giving tax breaks, and also, we just passed one last week shopping cart ordinance. You can't have shopping carts abandoned, blighting up the City of Brockton anymore. There's an, an ordinance on the books. So, that's really what the role is, and uh, I love serving that way, and I ask for your vote on November 3. Thank you. Okay, and Shane Barnes. Oh, I'm so, sorry, Moses, go ahead. You're right. Moses, what is the role of an at-large councillor, and what do you see your role as being a member of the City Council? Well, I, um, I honestly believe that a lot of folks sometimes don't quite understand that we have a strong council, a weak mayor system in this city. And the role of a strong council is to basically hold the, uh, the executive branch accountable for some of the doings here in the city. Uh, our role, you know, it, it's been said here before, uh, we, we are citywide. Uh, it's our function and duty to represent the entire city, and that's what we try to do. I, as a city council at large, have brought in a different take. I, I, I've said it here before, and I'm going to say it again. I didn't go to City Hall to make friends. I didn't go to City Hall to become a rubber stamper for anybody. I went there to represent the interests of the voters in the city, and that's what I'll continue to do. We've got some serious problems in this community, but it's important for us to know exactly what our functions are. We're not here to create programs. We don't create programs. As it, as it was said, it's the mayor's budget that we look at. We can't add, but we can shortcut and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Shada Barnes. Thank you for that question. Um, as my colleague said, uh, the role of a councillor at large uh, is to be supportive, is to work as a, a legislative body for the betterment of the city. And I can only speak from my experience, and what I can say is my role has actually changed from two years ago to now, and it will continue to change. It's a moving, flowing thing. And my initial role was to learn and to become intimately involved with how the city works and what I needed to know in order to, to make decisions on behalf of, of the people of, of the, uh, the city of Brockton. Now my role is to uh, collaborate with the, my fellow colleagues. I, I'm pretty sure that none of my colleagues will say that I have not been uh, in collaboration with them, even if we disagree on some things. Um, that is my role. My role is to be supportive, and going forward, my role will be uh, more of a leadership role. I foresee myself taking more of a leadership role on the council, initiating some uh, new new resolves, some new ordinances. I'm working now with our city clerk to work on some things on how our city is run and checking to see if that's something that we want to keep up with. Um, we have a lot of things that we want to do and I plan to be in the forefront of all of these things going forward and continuing to, uh, su to support my colleagues in government. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Good question, Kevin. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question which I will ask um, and I'm going to start first with Gary Keith. Um, 
the city council, every, you can walk up to the mic, the city council is on TV every Monday night or on a Tuesday night, as in the case of a holiday, uh, and the FinCom is on the opposite week, and then they go on summer schedule. As a councilor at large, you, people have mentioned that they go to the different ward councilors' meetings. How would you communicate with your constituents as a councilor at large representing the whole city? Well, as a councilor at large, basically one of the things that I would do is I would work with all the other the seven ward councilors to set up uh, ward meetings that they would actually keep this time around because whether the ward councilor was there or not, as a city councilor at large, I would actually hold it myself uh, if that was the case. But I believe that uh, I would send out, I would set up a, um, on my own personal website that would be accessible by everybody, anything that's going on uh, or that has happened in the, in the uh, council meetings. Um, that will be accessible that way there. Um, again, my phone number is public record is always on. I mean, I've actually had phone calls already in the middle of the night. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, I would be accessible and uh, I would actually get out there all the time. I mean, I'm always in the city around. I get stopped in the supermarkets, everything else. I actually ran into one of our counselors in the supermarket one time and he gave me the, some time also. So. I would actually uh, follow that role a little bit and I'd be accessible no matter where I was and what time of day. Thank you. Thank you. And the question would next be for Susan DeCastro. Can we repeat the question? Now? Question is um, City Councils and FinCom are on TV once a week. How else would you communicate as a City Councilor at large where the Ward Councilors call the Ward meetings? What would you do perhaps differently? Well. I would support the ward counselors and I would attend the, all of their, their meetings. I would also attend other meetings in the city, um, the various boards, planning board, zoning board, licensing committee. Um, anything that affects the city is the role of, I think, a counselor at large. And I would also be visible, football games, picnics, farmers markets, um, festivals. I think you have to be around talking to people and seeing how our residents are enjoying themselves and how they're enjoying living. Um, I could see myself doing some door-to-door -door and doing and having some meetings in my own right. I would also love the idea of the um, citywide meetings that um, Mr. Sullivan instituted while he was president of the City Council, bringing all of the council and the various uh, boards together for a citywide meeting to talk about the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next would be Adias. Thank you, Matt. The same way that I'm happening right now, I go to different places, go to the churches to talk to people, go to a festival, go to the kids' game, football, go to street meeting, go to ward meetings. I will do the same thing. The same way I'm asking for your vote now, I go to you, door to door. When I become city councilor, I will go to visit the church because most of people go to church. So that's the best place you can find them. Listen to them when they have a concern. Put your phone number out there. Make sure you return the phone call. Set a website. Answer, answer emails. I will be visible everywhere around the city the same way I'm visible now while I'm asking for your vote. So please, give me your vote on November 3rd. I will be there to serve you the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um Craig Pina. Communication is key as a counselor. Uh, and one, one, of the, one of the ways that, that I've, I've been communicating is using social media. To, is it, it's social media. You, if you want to talk to people, you've got to go where they are. I'm not talking about some other nefarious sites that uh, have seemed to raise trouble around the city. But I'm talking about uh, actually communicating with people where they are, going, going to uh, the ward meetings, going to uh, the festivals. We, I was at Tower Fest uh, just this past weekend. I, I spent a lot of time with uh, youth sports, Brockton Junior Boxers, Brockton Youth Softball, Brockton Raiders, uh, just being out there, meeting the people where they are, and listening to their concerns. Thank you, Craig. Um, Shana would be next. Um, thank you again for that question. I would actually continue to do what I've been doing. It's funny because uh, just today, 
I was accused of posting too much on my social media and uh, letting people know what's going on in the city. But I'm a firm believer in um, information and education. It, a byproduct of that is access. That's one of the major concerns. As I walk door to door the, uh, these neighborhoods along with my colleagues, that's the one major thing that people are talking about, that they don't know things that are going on or they get the information last, um, you know, last minute and it's not really first-hand information. So they're frustrated by that. And if you don't know, sometimes people can retreat. I want to get people out. I want to collaborate with folks. So um, I would definitely use the, the social media medium, um, my website, my phone number is available. I, got, I actually got a call today from a constituent asking me to be an advocate for a particular issue that uh, she was having. Um, and I, I, again, I would just kind of continue to, to do that. And I've also been accused of um, my official Facebook page uh, as being the most informational uh, page on Facebook at this particular point with regard to goings on and things uh, in the city. So I would definitely use that medium and um, anything that would, that would be available to me. Thanks, Shana. Uh, next, Moses. Well, I um, I attend the uh, the ward councilors' meetings uh, whenever one is uh, is called, and one one I'm aware of that they actually are having those meetings. But I I belong to the largest church in this city. In any given Sunday, there's around 1,200 people or so at this church, so I do go with uh, where others don't usually go. Um, being a member of the ethnic community, I go to the meetings that others have shied away from. I mean, we, we were talking about ward council meetings. You go to these meetings, sometimes there's 20 to 30 people in it. I just came back uh, last <laughs> night from Philadelphia, taking a group of almost 100 people to Philly for a sightseeing uh, event in Philadelphia, people from the community that have never traveled beyond that. So those are ways of kind of staying in touch and getting hold of the real issues that uh, the Brocktonians are facing. Uh, by going to them, and uh, not necessarily just to do it in a traditional way, but to do it in a very untraditional way. Thank you, Moses. And Winfar, I mean, Robert Sullivan. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think when you're an elected official, you're a public servant, right? You serve the public, the, the constituents, the taxpayers, the residents. And uh, what I've always done is I've always gone to anything and everything that I've been invited to. Uh, you start with your ward uh, colleagues, you go to all those meetings, uh, but you also go to the Downtown Business Association, Campbell or Montel or the Chamber of Commerce. You go anywhere. I, I'm a communicant of a Lady of Lords Church on Sunday. I shop in Brockton, Market Basket, Shaw, Stop and Shop. Went to Vincente's the other day. I, I, I think you need to go everywhere because that's where you're going to meet the people. That's where they're going to ask you questions or, or advocate for them. Uh, be it at my son and daughter's soccer game or Little League, that's what you need to do. You need to go to different public events, uh, Brockton High School events, uh, but ultimately it's also social media, which my colleagues have talked about, Facebook, I do e-newsletters, e phone calls, websites. Uh, but really, I think when you serve the public, you just need to be accessible. That's, that's really, the, in essence, what being a, a counselor at large, being accessible to everybody within the city of Brockton, all-inclusive at all times, and being your voice. So uh, that's pretty much it, guys. That's what you need to do to do it the right way, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Wynn Farwell. <laughs> Keep looking down the line for the next name. I think the most important thing is to have your telephone number listed and respond to constituent calls. We have a significant number of people in this community who don't get out to football games, who maybe aren't on social media, and when they have an issue, that is paramount to them to have that issue resolved. They should be able to reach me or whoever is on the city council because this is a job. I think sometimes people think that it's just an elected position. It's a job. It's funded by taxpayers' money, and we should be very responsive to the needs of our constituents. Visibility is important. But I also like what Councillor Sullivan did. I would hope that we would have an at-large group, a, the four councillors who end up on the City Council. I would hope that they would have periodic meetings, share with constituents what's on their plate, what are the upcoming agenda items. The more information you provide to the public, the better informed they are, and they can provide you with necessary and valuable feedback to address those issues. So communication is key, particularly with the individual councillor at large, but also with the four at-large councillors as a group. We should work together as our, uh, with our colleagues, all 11 of them, and with each other. 
Thank you all for that question. Uh, before I go on, I'm just going to make my standard offer that I do every two years. Um, Shana said the word access. We're Brockton Community Access, and one way to communicate with the community is here. I don't want to see people every two years when they're running for election or re-election. Um, Councilor Sullivan took me up on that when he was council president, and I think it's important. We also have radio, and uh, people, and, and, and not to mention, there's, there's all sorts of media outlets to, to take advantage of. So we're here to help you communicate. Next question is for, from Kevin. Well, this question is going to be so much, uh, so much of a, uh, a general question. I think it's probably one of the top issues uh, with Brocktonians uh, this day, and it gives you an opportunity to show and shine as a community leader. In your opinion, what does the city need to do to make the city streets safer? I'm going to start with Wynne Farwell. Well, if anyone stands up and says it's an easy solution or a quick fix, then quite frankly, they're not being honest with you. I think you have to expand the task force that's in place with the district attorney, the state police, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, federal officials. But on the local level, it's absolutely essential to grow and develop more neighborhood crime watch programs. At one point in this city, we had block leaders, we had ward leaders, and the feedback from all of those folks as to what was going on in their neighborhoods, suspicious vehicles, suspicious people, activity going on at all hours of the day, day and night, that was fed into the police department and the police department could respond. I've certainly been on record saying that we need more police officers and that means that the city council needs to very carefully eva evaluate every budget and where there are savings that can be affected, carve out those savings, not approve the entire appropriation that's submitted and hopefully those funds could be put into an account for future public safety hiring. Thank you. Next would be uh, Robert Sullivan. Kevin and, uh, and Mark, I mean, that's the, the number one thing. It doesn't matter uh, where you are in the city. Number one thing is how to make Brockton safer uh, for its residents, uh, the people that live here, people that work here. And uh, my 10 years on the council, that's really been the paramount issue. Uh, you can talk about the power plant, you can talk about the casino, but ultimately it's, it's public safety. Uh, and, and ultimately we need to be able to have an all-inclusive approach. We need to have everybody in the city of Brockton act as one. Uh, some people have said to me that's a fairy tale, but that's really the only way to trigger successful change. Uh, we all also, you know, growing up in Brockton, uh, you know, you had parents that didn't have to work two or three jobs and you had your neighbors that were watching out. Um, that's not reality now. So we need to be able to have, of course, much more neighborhood watch, much more of an interaction between the residents and the police, the men and women that put their, their lives on the line every day, public safety officials. Uh, we need to, as elected officials, as city councilors that ratify the budgets, we need to give the public officials, the public safety officials, the tools of the trade. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that they have what they need to make the seat straight streets safe, but ultimately it's working together as one. Okay, uh, Moses? Just to remind the folks who are, might just be tuning in again, the question is, in your opinion, what does the city need to do to make the city streets safer? As it was said here, I honestly believe that public safety is the issue here in the city of Brockton, and it's an issue that needs to be uh, worked at and resolved before we can even talk about anything else in this community. But I also, I come, for, I, come, I come at it from a different angle. I honestly believe that throwing police and throwing money at the problem isn't really going to resolve the problems. Otherwise, it would have been resolved. Uh, the men and women in the uh, Brockton PD, they do a great job. But you know what? I frankly want to work with the community to prevent crime from happening. Because once the police show up to resolve the issues, they're doing a very good job. The shooting we had today in Ward 3 down by Packard Way, they were out there collecting the shells uh, on, the, on the ground. My, my dream and my uh, belief is to prevent the shootings from happening right off the bat. And that's what we need to work together as a community to, uh, to make sure that we resolve those issues. There's too many people in this community that aren't really all that informed in this community. And I think as a community, we need to do a better job in working uh, uh, public safety and the community together to resolve the issues. Thank you. Shana? Thank you again. Uh, the gentleman that spoke earlier, I, I agree with them wholeheartedly. And um, my approach is a little from column A, a little from column B. Um, I really do think that the men and women of the police department who recently actually endorsed me, the Policemen's uh, Association endorsed me and my candidacy, they work tirelessly 
to keep us safe every single day. Um, if they worked 24, if every single one of our police force, if they worked 24 hours a day, they still wouldn't be able to eradicate what goes on. Like Councillor Rodriguez said, we have to do something to be able to, to make it a preventative measure. And I personally feel that we need to be accountable to each other, we need to be accountable to one another, we need to be accountable to our neighbors and our friends, and we need, if we see something, we need to say something. If only you know what goes on. The only, when a crime occurs, the only people that know about that is that person that committed it and that one other person that they may have told. So if you know what's going on, you have got to not be afraid and you've got to come forward and you've got to either warn um, that something's going to happen or tell information if you already do know. We're, we're, in a, we're definitely in a battle, but if we go into this battle already afraid and our enemies know that we are afraid, then we have already lost. So we've got to gird ourselves up and be accountable to one another. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, in, if you want to repeat the question again, uh, Gary Keith. Okay, in your opinion, what does the city need to do to make the city streets safer? That's a very good question. And again, I'm going to say exactly what the councilors before me have already said. Our, Boston, our Brockton Police Department is doing a very fine job. And we can hire 100 more officers and put them on the street, but it will not stop what's going on right now. I believe what we need to do is we actually need our youth programs. We need programs that are going to keep our, uh, the youth of the city uh, active, okay? Um, give them things that they can work for, how they can get a job. Uh, if once we bring some new revenue in here, these kids can get a job. However, um, we have, uh, I attended a program, an event the other night, and uh, it was up a team challenge. And basically they have a success rate going on right now for, the, for drug addiction. We have a um, uh, Hamid's Academy that's up there at Westgate Mall that's been in this city for over 30 years. And people don't even know that all the youth that are up there right now, and they're being active. And I think that we need to uh, educate our youth Okay, not only in the school system, but outside of that, teaching them how to get a job, teaching them how to, uh, teaching them respect, teaching them self-respect, and this way here, I think that ties into our public safety here in the city of Brockton. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Um, next, Susan Castro. Um, in your opinion, what does the city need to do to make the city streets safer? Thank you. Violent crime is out of control. It, it's very discouraging and it's very worrisome. Our children are back in school and we worry about them walking home um, and on the buses. Um, I have a little different, I have a different take on, on public safety than perhaps some of the others do. I do think that the police, many of the police are working very hard and I do think it takes time because it's reached a point, a level where it will take a while to catch the bad guys and girls. Um, you know, I've done a lot of reading about crime, and I'm a, I'm a great admirer of Bill Bratton, and we heard quite a bit about going to visit Bill Bratton in August. Um, he's the New York police chief. Well, he came from Boston um, originally, and when he first went to New York City in the early 1990s, he was espousing a theory called broken windows theory. and what he did was he changed the focus of the New York City Police Department by going after quality of life crimes that were considered minor in the face of shootings and other violent crimes. Um, he told, well, these are the kind of crimes that weren't being paid any attention to. And that's what I would do. I would go after speeders. I would ask our police to focus on some of the lesser crimes. And I think we would catch a lot of criminals in that way. Thank you. Okay, uh, Adios Pia. Uh, I think that's a good question. Uh, last Friday night, I went to a wake on, on down not Main Street. A young man, 27 years old, last Monday, kissed mom and say, sh shook his daddy and said goodbye, I'll be back. And then he never returned home, he gunned down by a suspect, 22 years old. Imagine it was your son. How would you feel? This happened in Overland Street. I attend the work. Public safety is a big issue. I think no matter how many police officers that we have in the city, is the strategy that we use. I think they're doing a good job now, and I still believe there is room for improvement. As your next city council at large, I would advocate for community policing. Have a good relationship between the resident, the police department, 
and something happened, if you see something, you report it. But for that person to report the crime, they need to have a choice from the police officer as well. That's why we need in the city, we need community policing, and I advocate for that. Please, on November 3rd, give me a chance. I will be one to fight for that. Thank you. And Craig Pina. Crime in the city is an important issue. Uh, we've heard before that there is no simple issue. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we've made the investment as a city in adding on 20 new police, 21 new police officers over the next two years. And those police officers will look a lot more like the city that they, that they serve. Uh, so we have the infrastructure. We'll hit, we had investments in technology, expanded shot spotter technology, instant fingerprint technology. What we need to do is expand our community policing programs, our DARE programs, our great programs, coffee with a cup, uh, neighborhood watches. Uh, but most importantly, I was, I was at an event the other night speaking with uh, John Andre, uh, retired school teacher, has been in Brockton for a, a, a lot of years. Uh, his, he, he brought up a, a great point, which, which I full, full heartedly, wholeheartedly agree with. Um, the best police officer is a parent in the home. As a parent to two daughters, I'm the best police officer in my home. I'm the best teacher, the best police officer. We need to teach people respect. We need to teach people that, that, that they, they're the ones responsible for their young people, for their, for their children in the city of Brockton. Thank you. Um, next question is we have all heard about the number one priority being public safety. Okay. I would like to ask all of you if you would think outside the box for a minute and go down the list a little deeper and what is a priority that would be a quality of life issue here in the city of Brockton to make it a better place, a safer place, uh, a, a more welcoming place? I'm going to start with Shana. Thank you. Um, a quality of life issue, I, I think that a lot of people are either seeing or becoming um, more sensitive to or, or, or hypersensitive to uh, are our homeless. And uh, some of the people that hang out, for, less, for lack of a better term, uh, in, the, in our downtown area. Um, when I was young, when I, when I was a kid, which is just several years ago, um, you know, the homeless people and people that um, didn't have any place to go they were kind of centralized in an area. But as time has gone on, and 20, 25 years now have passed, it's everywhere. People are everywhere. They're at the mall. They're at uh, the other end of 27. They're definitely in the, the Perkins Park. They're down now under the bridges uh, on um, School Street. There are a lot of people that are in this, this uh, city with no place to go, I don't know if they have resources. I'm not really 100% sure. And of course, we can talk about the tent city back over at the CSX uh, lot. So that's one of the things that I think a lot of people are very, very concerned about. We have panhandlers that knock on uh, the car windows as people sit and they, they wait at a red light. People are being approached uh, now at the gas stations. Um, it's becoming a big issue. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say that I've actually been involved with working with uh, our planning department and Rob May and some of the folks over at Main Spring House, John Yaswinski, and some of his, his people there. And that we're working together in a partnership and kind of figuring out as a city and as a unit how we can all use what we have to help uh, with this issue and, and help maybe, you know, kind of corral it a little bit and get it back under control. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to let everybody go on this one a little longer. It's a minute 30. And next up, I'm going to go to Gary Keith. <clears throat> That is a very good question, okay? And again, I have to go along the lines of what Shana said. Basically, um, I believe that our homeless population and our veterans, our homeless veterans, um, there has to be resources out there. There has to be uh, shelter for them. Um, there's people that have gone over to actually fight for the freedom that we have in this country, and, um, and they come home with no place to go. Okay, and I think that we need services and things like that that can actually assist them with mental illness if they have it from any type of uh, illnesses that they're bringing back from being in the war overseas or whatever. But to see our, our, our veterans homeless, that really bothers me and it hits home. To see any homeless, uh, it bothers me. I think that, again, I mentioned Teen Challenge. We have, um, we just have to find ways of actually finding funding that we can actually assist with some of these, uh, some of the people here that actually have substance abuse um, in beds for treatment, but of quality type treatments, not nothing that's going to, you know, they go there for seven days and they release them again and they're right back out into the street with no services at all 
to help them. So I believe that that actually is, uh, is very paramount to me, um, and I think that we really need to address that, our homeless situation and our homeless veterans. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, next would be Moses. I'm going to go back um, and beat up that sa the same old drum. I, I still believe it's the culture of crime that exists in our community as a quality of life. The perception of crime, whether it's taking place, not taking place, is to me uh, the number one issue facing this community. Uh, we can talk about all these other issues, uh, but crime and the perception of crime prevents businesses from moving into our community, prevents businesses from hiring people that, and, and forcing people to become homeless in a way, uh, prevent businesses from supporting community activities where we can actually create other programs to prevent our youth from, from being in the situation they're, they're in. But it's this perception of crime and the negativity that surrounds the city sometimes that actually is to me the number one issue that prevents this city to have that kind of quality of life. Okay, thank you. Um, we're gonna go next to Susan Nicastro. Do you need me to repeat the question? Go ahead. Okay, basically um, asking you to think a little outside of the box. We all talked about the number one issue uh, being crime. Uh, is there another issue affecting the quality of life, something that you think should be brought to the forefront to make uh, the city a better place to live? Yes. I think the issue that comes to mind immediately for me is maintaining and supporting the well-being of our seniors. I've recently met with Janice Fitzgerald at the Council on Aging. She's a terrific woman doing a great job there. And she tells me that in our public housing we have about 10,000 seniors, many of them who have lived here their whole lives and want to stay in Brockton. I know when I volunteer at the Charity Guild, so many of our volunteers as well as our our clients in the food pantry and the thrift store are seniors, um, men and women, but primarily women since women tend to outlive men. And we want for them what we want for ourselves. We want them to be able to remain active parts of the community, living in their own homes and being supported as they age and as aging, it, the issues that come with aging come up um, and affect them. I think our seniors need to be better educated about what services are available for them in our community, what helps that can be brought in to keep them in their homes for a longer period of time, and for keeping them socially involved in the community. Um, it's, an, it's an issue that's close to my heart. My mother lived with me for the last five years of her life. I was her caregiver. I was also her social system. Um, we, we need to do more to help our seniors, and that will enhance their quality of life as well as our own. We are all aging. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, would be Adius. Thank you, Mark. I think that's a good question. <coughs> When I was camping, it was like about, in the summer, it was about like 95 degrees. I went to one of the high rise, and I met a woman with one leg on a wheelchair. I couldn't stay long because it was too hot. And I said, ma'am, how do you live like that? And she said to me, the way they do business on Goddard is take it or leave it. And she's about 85 years old. I don't think he's right. We're not supposed to treat our elderly like that. The human just like us. When you drive down Main Street, too many homeless. And that's where everything started. And I agree with my opponent, Susan, there's a theory called broken window. If you don't fix it when it's small, when it gets worse, you're not going to be able to do it. And people see if you don't care about your home houses, they don't care about either. That's where we have drug in the street. That's where we have homeless, they're doing prostitution. So all this thing is a package. If you solve one, basically you're going to solve everything. When you take them out of the street, you need to give them the resources to survive because some of them are drug addicts. You don't, they don't belong to jail, but they belong to treatment. And Pinamet, where I work, there is a program called 90 Days Treatment. We need to help them, give them the resources and take them off the street because some of them are over the ones that fought for this great country so we cannot leave them in the street. So when, when I get elected, I would advocate for those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Craig, Peter. 
course, quality of life in the city of Brockton means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, of course, we need, we need to support our homeless veterans. We need to support our, our disabled and, and, uh, and our elderly. But as far as quality of life, uh, we need to fight the perception. We need to change the perception and change the reality of blight in the city of Brockton. Um, too often, people come to, the, come to the city of Brockton and, and, and see vacant buildings, boarded up buildings, homeless people in the street, and they have, they have this, this image of Brockton that's reinforced by what they see. Uh, we need to find a way to change that. We need to invite investment into the city of Brockton. We need to improve uh, facades of businesses, of, of buildings in the city of Brockton to make Brockton look like a vibrant and inviting place. We do that by inviting investment, by, by working on, on getting a downtown college campus back on track uh, in, the, in downtown Brockton by getting people and, and making things active. Uh, that's really the way to solve a lot of issues as far as quality of life in the city of Brockton. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Winfire. I'm going to go with Winfire. I told you I was going to mix it up. <laughs> this time I'm right. <laughs> go ahead, Win. I actually have three very dissimilar issues that are important to me. Uh, the first one, and I, I have to commend the mayor on this one, we have to continue doing everything we can about the opioid addiction problem. We've lost too many young people, and that problem feeds into the crime issue because people who are desperate to find the drugs that they need to which they are addicted, they commit crimes, whether it's robberies, break-ins, whatever it is, those folks are the ones that are out in the street and they are trying to find the money and the means to get the drug, which unfortunately they've become addicted to. The second issue is I think we have to be very careful as a city council to watch our spending because when the new contract comes up for rubbish removal, I don't want a, a large increase in the fees to homeowners or we're going to force people who have lived here all their lives, especially our seniors, we're going to force them into a situation where they may not be able to afford their homes. And the last thing is I think that we have to address the quality of life issue with some of our streets. I was up in Ward 6 today and I have to tell you there was a street which I hope I don't have to drive down again until it's repaired. And that is a quality of life issue because people go walking, kids ride bicycles, people drive their automobiles, they don't want their vehicles damaged because the streets are in disrepair. So when the chapter money, 90 money comes in from the state, we've really got to prioritize how that's going to be spent and we've got to make sure that we address a lot of these street issues which uh, uh, clearly need to be repaired. Okay. Robert Sullivan. So if you're a homeowner or, or a renter in the city of Brockton, uh, you want a safe community, but you also want a clean community. And I've been on the council 10 years, and I've really been banging the drum to make sure that we tackle blight, be it the foreclosure epidemic here in the city of Brockton, number one or number one or two in the Commonwealth, uh, where we addressed it by having a receivership program, working with the Attorney General's office to take over uh, some abandoned properties and beautify them and put them back on the market, working with the Housing Authority. Uh, also, uh, actually tackling uh, actual uh, uh, blight relative to uh, areas that are overgrown. Just uh, last Thursday, I called Larry Rowley, DPW Commission, because a resident in Ward 2 said, listen, go to West Harvard Street. The grass is this high on the sidewalk. Someone's putting drugs there. I called Larry and the, the crew went over and cleaned that up. It's the little things that matter on a daily basis. Uh, the shopping cart ordinance, uh, the illegal dumping ordinance, these are laws on the books that are going to help your day-to-day -day operations in the city of Brockton if you live here or work here. Uh, but I also think you have to look at, you know, people mentioned taking care of our retirees and our seniors, the most vulnerable, and I've always done it for 10 years, working to make sure the homeless are taken care of. We need to address that. But it's also reaching outside and going out side of the box and calling the MBTA and calling the state to come before the city council and I've done this before when I when I got on the train and I looked at all the trash and litter that was disgusting coming into Brockton uh, and I had those people come before us and it was cleaned up within the week those are the things that you can do as an elected official that will better the day-to-day -day quality of life issues for the people that you represent and you're the voice for them and I've done that and I hope to continue to do that thank you thank you uh, the next question is from Kevin and we're going to start with uh, Moses first now what I would do here is kind of combine a couple of uh, controversial topics. You guys, you guys are uh, accustomed to that. Uh, because your next term, you could be voting on either one of these. One of them, of course, the uh, wastewater uh, for the proposed power plant. You know, where you stand on that. Give your thought on that, if you could, briefly. Also, the Aquaria desalination plant. You could possibly be discussing that during the next two years. So if you would, please give me your thoughts on both, if you could. Well, as far as the power plant is concerned, I, I was just uh, at the uh, planning uh, meeting the other day uh, testifying on behalf of the residents of the city that that project is not a good project for the city of Brockton. 
it's a project full of promises, promises that cannot be kept, promises of um, health and security in this community that I don't see how that can be done, promises of job creation and uh, revitalization that doesn't really exist. Now we're talking about putting a fence around it to make it look like uh, uh, a prison uh, around in the city of Brockton. So those are, those are the reasons why I'm against that project and I'll continue to be against that project. As far as the Aquarius is concerned, I'm actually the one that proposed cutting their budget uh, during the budget uh, cycle this past year because I believe that that uh, organization has not fulfilled its, uh, its promises and they're playing games with us. We ask them to come before us to provide us with some basic information. They haven't done that. Um, the, I know the mayor actually had uh, submitted a, uh, a plan to purchase that plant, uh, that, power, uh, that plant at $88 million. To me, it's not even worth half of that. I'm against uh, uh, continuing to, uh, to fund the, uh, the Aquaria because I don't see the benefits that it actually provides to the Brockton at what we are paying for it, and that's why I'll continue to fight for the, uh, the people of Brockton to make sure that those projects either stay off the books or, or, or that they actually provide us with uh, the resources that we need to understand what they're coming from. Okay, thanks. Uh, minute 30 to respond to that. Next would be Wynn Farwell. <clears throat> I'm very much against the uh, power plant. I don't think that we should ever have a, a project come into the city that could, number one, diminish property values for those people who live down in Ward 4. People work all their lives to maintain their homes and to have the city adopt a a project which could reduce the property value significantly and potentially cause some environmental hazards is inexcusable. There would be truckloads of debris coming into the city to go to that power plant. Could someone put asbestos into some of those truckloads? Who's going to inspect them? And it's a risk that I just would not take. Uh, with respect to the Aquaria, power, uh, Aquaria water treatment plant, that was a doomed project from the beginning. Who knows what the population of Brockton would be 20 years out? Who knows what the new federal regulations may be? As to the value of the plant, I'm not sure, and I agree with the council, as you can believe anything that comes from the folks that run that plant. What I would do is I would go to the governor, ask him if he would have two or three top engineers from the MWRA. They already operate a water treatment plant. Ask them for some technical advice and come in, take a look at the plant, what is it worth, what can it do, where are we with that plant? And the state does have a history of providing technical assistance to municipalities in certain uh, areas. Thank you. Um, next would be Craig Pina. Just a reminder of what the question is, is give me your thoughts on both the per possible purchase mm -hmm. of the Aquara uh, desalination plant and also the sale of wastewater to the proposed power plant project. Okay, just to be clear, we're talking about the sale of wastewater, not the siting of the plant, because we, yeah, we need it's, two to, different, it's two different yeah, topics. We, we need to be very clear that, that the, when we're talking wastewater, it's, it's effluent water. It's water that's been treated. One more cycle and it's as clean as tap water. And if this water actually before it, it's going to be used to cool turbines is actually going to be filtered again so it's actually cleaner than tap water. Uh, it's actually cleaner than drinking water. So, so there, there is no problem in my mind with the sale of effluent water to, a power, to the power plant to cool the turbines. Uh, the, it's, 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 it's a clean project. There, are, there, will no be, there will be no truckloads of debris or asbestos going in there. Uh, it, there is no evidence that it will de de decrease home values. There is no evidence that it will, it will cause environmental problems. Uh, this just doesn't happen around natural gas-fired power plants. And it's time we, we, that we be honest about that, not listen to the fear and innuendo that's been spouted for the last 12 years. Uh, as far as the, the desalinization plant, um, the state right now is, is looking to, to uh, form a regional water, water and sewer board. Uh, we, we have sewer capacity which we can sell to other communities and we can also sell water capacity that we excess water capacity that we have in the city to other communities as well. The state is looking for other communities to stop tapping wells uh, so, so we need to support our other communities for, for expansion. Um, we, don't, we can't be an island unto ourselves. Brockton is an economic engine for the whole area and as Brockton goes the entire area goes and we also need to support the growth in, other in our surrounding communities. Thank you, Craig. Uh, next would be Adias Pierre. Thank you, Mark. Uh, for the power plant, I believe I against it for the first day. But I believe there is a lawsuit going on. We need to get to the bottom of it because we are using uh, uh, taxpayer to pay the lawyers over something that's been going on for about eight years, I believe. So no matter what, we have to solve it. So I think 
as a city councillor, I will advocate to have a mutual agreement between those party people who want to come with the department and, and the city. So, and when it comes to the water desalination, I heard it's a state requires to have, is a state requirement to have a second source of water. The contract isn't over yet. The same way when the casino came on the table, the city councillors, all of them voted to put in the ballot, I will advocate to let the people, people decide it because they get tax money and they spend, they have a say. We, not, we cannot make decisions for them all the time. Give them a chance. I will advocate to put the matter on the ballot and let them decide. That's what I will do when I become a city councillor. Thank you. Next, uh, Robert Sullivan. And just again, I want to reiterate the question to so folks who are just tuning in at home. These are possible votes that can be taken next year, whether it's to sell affluent water to the proposed power plant project or a possible purchase of Aquaria, the desalination plant. That's right. And, and first of all, people have to understand that there's an ordinance, there's a law in the city of Brockton right now to sell effluent water or for use of effluent water. There needs to be a two-thirds supermajority vote of the city council. That's on the books right now. That's the ordinance. And I don't anticipate that changing in the near future. I am against the power plant. I have been. It's not the right technology. It's not the right location. It's short-sighted mm -hmm. to think it's going to be a win-win for the city of Brockton. It's not. You don't put a price tag on health and safety. I've said this for years and years. I'm going to continue to. I did it last week at the planning board. I actually submitted that ordinance into the record uh, because two-thirds vote is, is a supermajority and it's something that needs to be realized. Not everybody realized that we do have an ordinance, a law, in the books. In terms of Aquaria, I've been the city councilor for uh, over four years now. I filed a resolve four years ago to have the representatives from Aquaria come before the city council when he sit as finance committee to discuss the contract relative to marketing. How have they marketed? Who have they marketed to? Uh, four years ago they blew us off. Three years ago they blew us off. Uh, I refiled it with this legislative session right now, and they've come before us uh, two times, uh, ill-prepared, uh, disrespectful. They came last Monday, didn't have any information that we still needed. They submitted it the morning of the meeting, which is asinine. Um, $88 million is crazy. We're in the people business, the government business. We're not in the water business. There's only one customer. They've been selling this for years and years. Brockton's the only customer. So why would we spend $88 million to acquire a water business, owning a liability all the way down to, uh, to a Sonnet, all the way to Brockton? It just doesn't make business sense, practical sense, or common sense, and I am opposed to that, and I will continue to be opposed to that. Thank you very much. Okay, next would be um, Gary Keith. Repeat the question, please. question is, being a member of the city council, if you are elected, you, the two possible votes you might end up taking, and one is to sell affluent water to the proposed power plant, or you could also be voting to possibly purchase the Aquarium desalination plant. Okay. Your thoughts on both. Thank you. Um, as as far as the affluent water goes, I have to, um, I agree with Craig Peen over here that uh, that water is clean before it goes back into the uh, Salisbury River and, uh, and it's also cleaned again before it actually starts to cool the, uh, the cooling towers there on the, uh, on the uh, po proposed power plant. So um, would I be in favor of that? Yes, I would. Uh, am I in favor of the uh, power plant? I am because I did my research on it right now and that the levels down there in Ward 4, the air quality levels, we're at 33 negligible uh, levels. Right now, they did some cleanup on the sewer treatment center, and those points, those negligible levels are down to 13. And with the proposed power plant going in there right now, that will add three negligible levels to us, which will actually put it, bring it to 15, which is way below the uh, safe zone, which is 35 negligible uh, levels for air quality. So in that area, I am in favor of all of that. As far as Aquaria goes, um, that is something that I still need a little bit more research on it, but I do have to uh, concur with, some of, uh, with one of the city councilors that I had a conversation with at $88 million. I think that that's just uh, way too much at this point here. However, we do have enough time left on that contract that we're paying $6 million a year for, and when it's all over, if, if the contract's not broken or something happens in the meantime, we're still going to end up paying just as, as much money for water that we're not using. Thank you. Okay, next would be Shana. Thank you, again. Um, I have to concur with my colleagues, uh, uh, Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Rodriguez, on both of their positions on these projects. Currently sitting uh, as the city councillor at large, I've been intimately uh, aware and familiar and exposed to a lot of these issues with these two particular projects that you brought up, um, Kevin. And the treatment, I'm going to take it 
actually in reverse order, the treatment that the council, the legislative body of this city, as, as Councilor Sullivan um, has mentioned before, the treatment that they have showed us is abysmal. I, I, I've never um, seen so much blatant open disrespect um, of cordial um, in invitations to come to our meetings. And like uh, Councilor Sullivan said, when they, when they come there, they're arrogant. Um, they could care less about the information that we're asking them for. All they know is that they're getting their check. And I do have to commend uh, Councilor Rodriguez. When he did propose to cut their funding, that was the only time that we started to see them. And I've only been on the council two years. So I'm sure you know, for four years, um, it's more than frustrating for Councilor Sullivan. That was the only time they even came, even thought to come uh, or, or to drive in this direction. And then when they did come, they were ill-prepared and they were arrogant. And, and I absolutely don't think that that is a way to do business with these people, um, in addition to all of the other, other issues with the plant and the, the money and all of those other kinds of things. So um, I do not believe in going into business relationships with people that openly disrespect me. With regard to the power plant, I have also been against that uh, project from the very, very beginning. Day, every day there's more information that comes out about the unsafeness, or the, uh, the, the ill safety of uh, the effluent water. And it's the, the things that we don't know, there's so many things that we still don't know. The independent engineering uh, uh, program, or actually agency, that was hired to do an evaluation of that particular project, they, come, they came up with 70 um, questions that still haven't been answered. Affluent water is one of them. We cannot have sewer water dropping on our heads. That, in my opinion, uh, it promotes an unsafe and a quality of life issue as well. Thank you. And uh, Susan DeCastro. Susan, I'll repeat the question. That is, is, if you are elected, you could possibly be voting on two things. One, the purchase of affluent water for the proposed power plant and also the purchase of a queer desalination plant, if you will. Thank you. Um, I would be against the sale of effluent water to the power plant, but you see, I've, I've been against the power plant. I think it's the wrong location on Oak Hill Way, given the density of population and schools and nursing homes and elderly complexes that are all around it within very close proximity walking distance. Um, because of my opinion on the power plant, I've had the the distinction of being personally sued in the, the multi-million dollar civil rights case currently pending against the city. So I, I am careful about what I say about it. Um, I, I am personally against it though, and I am personally against um, effluent water which will be used as a coolant and then not cleaned, going up a stack, turning into water vapor, um, being discharged into the river. I mean, it's just, it doesn't work on many, many levels. As for the desalinization plant, um, the desalinization plant, the decision to build it and to go in that, dis that route, it addressed a problem that the city was having. Um, there was a water ban and, and our growth as a city was stagnant. Um, it was a quick fix to end our building moratorium, but as time has gone on, we know the plant was not built as contracted for. Um, it cannot produce the capacity of water as contracted for. We tried calling on it in June when we had a water pipe break from Silver Lake and we couldn't get water as contracted for. It's not a good idea at $88 million. Both projects are a symbol of old Brockton, deals that were made to benefit very few. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to ask the next question, and uh, of course I didn't do the numbers yet, so I'm just going to randomly pick uh, numbers here. And I'm going to start and ask a kind of selfish question. I have advocated for 20 years on the Library Board of Trustees for uh, adequate funding, continued funding, um, and uh, some of the folks here have supported that as current elected officials. In all these priorities, with public safety back to being number one, and budgets and resources, where do libraries fit into the whole grand scheme of things in terms of a priority for you? That's what I was starting to get at dealing with the quality of life issues and thinking outside of the box. So I'm going to start with uh, Gary Keith. Okay, thank you, Mark, for that question. As far as the, um, the funding for the libraries. I believe that all sit, fits into what I said earlier as far as our public safety again. When I talked about uh, youth programs, educating our youth, not only you know, giving them um, 
lessons on how to uh, get a job and all that. Basically, they would need, I think the funding for the library would be excellent because of the fact that that will also play into my public safety plan with the youth. Um, they need the library. They need to go there and study. They need to um, basically use every resource there because the way I would like to see it done, and I've talked to a lot of people around the city right now that actually have plans uh, and they want to educate our youth in these areas that we need. So they would, we would need our libraries right now. So I mean, we would have to keep them. Somehow we have to find the money to not only ed uh, for the youth programs, but the money would also have to go to funding the libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Next would be uh, Moses Rodriguez. When you have a, uh, a school system where close to 70 percent of the kids in the school system uh, come from homes and they qualify for reduced lunch, uh, the library plays an important piece uh, within their education system. I mean, we're assuming that all these children are coming from homes where there's computers. I mean, we've talked about uh, uh, the internet and the uh, and the ability to communicate with people, but you got to understand that a lot of times these kids and and these homes do not have access to what the library pro uh, provides them. So the the library to me is a very important piece. It was important to me when I was growing up in this community because I couldn't afford uh, coming from an immigrant home. I couldn't afford the uh, uh, the perks that some of the other homes had. So it it provided me with the tools. It provided my children with tools, and it continues to provide our community with the tools necessary so that we can level the playing field as far as the, the kids in the, in the school system is concerned. So I support the library, whether or not we have the resources available in the city government to do better. Uh, that's something that we need to look into, but I would support anything that, act, that comes into looking for funding to uh, further uh, enhance our library system. Thank you. Uh, next would be Shana. And again, thank you for that question. Um, with it being a, a slightly selfish question, as you just said, I'll, I'll give a slightly selfish answer. Um, the library is actually a place where somebody who was very, very close to me spends virtually all of her spare time, um, and that's my mom, otherwise known as Shana's mom. Um, she goes to the library all the time, and she said it to uh, anybody that knows her will know that that's where she goes. She finds peace there. She finds solace there. They know her there in the library. <laughs> she, she's got you know, her own little system, her own uh, you know, social network that she's built there over the last few years and in going to the library, and that's what we need to continue to do. And just the other day in the meeting, um, the council approved some additional funding um, to en enhance some of the services in the library. So I definitely, I've been an advocate of, of libraries. I know several librarians who are good friends of mine. Um, and those are things that we do need in the city. Like Councilor Rodriguez said, we can't assume that everybody has access that we may have. Um, and, and they need those things. There, a lot of those things are provided right there at the library. I know that several of the area colleges, they hold um, tutoring sessions and things at the library. If we didn't have library hours and we didn't have staff and we didn't have the building, they wouldn't be able to do that. And then that just goes into some of what um, some of my colleagues have said already. Those things are trickled down, and if we don't have, if we don't value education, if we don't value advancement in our kids, we won't be competitive, and we'll just be further and further back. So I support the library. Thank you. Uh, next would be Robert Sullivan. So, Mike, you know, I, I mean, I've been on the council 10 years, and every budget cycle, be it when the library director was Harry Williams or Betsy, I, I always uh, support the library. I, I'm a card member of the foundation. Uh, and as what Shana just said, we just voted Monday night to ratify that. Um, when the East Library was being uh, rehabbed, I voted in favor of that, and I, I've been an advocate in pushing for the West Library. Um, you know, when I went to Brockton High, I used to study at the West Library. When I went to law school, I used to be at, at the Main Library. My dad and I go down to the Main Library all the time for genealogy research. It's awesome. A lot of people, what Moses said, don't don't have access to computers other than going to the library. So it makes sense to go to the library. It makes sense to support the library. Um, one thing that I've always said is Andrew Carnegie, we wouldn't have a library without Carnegie, right? He gave the money to the city of Brockton. Carnegie uh, fellowships, uh, we need to look at uh, the Bill Gates Foundation to see if we can get some more funding. I say it every single year. I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, uh -huh. But ultimately, we need to make sure that the library is a source, not just for our young, but also our old. A lot of seniors go there. They get the large print books. They go and look at the computers. They, they get the enterprise there as well. So I support the library. I think the library is something uh, that's really, really vital, not just for the present, but for the future of the city of Brockton and our youth and our seniors as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Wynne Farwell. 
Mark and, and those listening, I certainly support the libraries. And the most important thing is to not lose your state certification. So it becomes primarily the city's responsibility and certainly with the support of the council to approve an appropriation that is more than sufficient to meet the needs of the library certification process. The libraries are also kind of an adjunct part of learning at Brockton High School and the junior high schools. It's a safe place for kids to go after school, to do research, to learn more about different topics, to complete the required uh, uh, homework assignments that they have. If you look at communities that have strong library systems, you will see that they have a strong quality of life system. So if the mayor uh, can find additional funds for the library, and I'm elected, I would certainly be in support of approving that appropriation. I think we need to do more for the libraries because, again, when the college comes downtown, which hopefully it will, if the new health science building is built at Massasoit, I think Brockton's library system will really become an integral part of the whole learning process for a whole host of groups. Thank you, Wynn. Um, next would be Susan DeCastro. Well, I have to say personally, I was so disappointed when you didn't ask me about library support when we had our one-on-one -on -one interview in September because I grew up going to the library three times a week. Um, I was in every reading club there was. Um, libraries, in my experience, play such an important role in our communities. Um, as Wynne just said, not just for our children. I took my children there every week and we participated in all sorts of programs. Also for our seniors. One of my first memories of meeting my, my husband's mother, my mother-in-law, is she used to keep a bag right by the front door because she was a weekly regular at the south branch of the the Brockton Public Library, which used to be right in the heart of Campello. And she had her name on books that were reserved. She had a whole thing going. Every week she went to the library, read her favorite mysteries, never poetry, and uh, brought them back and got some more the next week. Um, libraries are so important. Um, I know right now the Brockton Public Library is open Monday and I believe Tuesday evenings. I wish their, t their hours would expand and they were open more evenings. It's actually a community resource, a place where the entire community can go and gather. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, Craig Pina. Funny thing about, about libraries, uh, my, when my wife and I go on vacation or we're in a, another town, anywhere, she's always, she always makes note of the library. Uh, so if we're in Wells, Maine, she says, oh, that's a nice library. Uh, not the scenery, not the beach, the, the library. So libraries are an important part and important, important to my family. Um, if anybody has not been down to the main library downtown, you find it's, it's a very active and vibrant building. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on down, down there. And yes, it's an important resource, especially for a community like Brockton, where there's a, there's a large population of people who don't have computer, computer access or smartphones. Um, what I'd like to see is more collaboration between the library and uh, different organizations like uh, Veteran Services or Council on Aging. We have a beautiful building downtown and we have two branch buildings uh, and some of the most valuable spaces there could be meeting spaces to hold, to hold programs for the Council <laughs> on Aging and Veteran Services. Uh, so yes, the, I, I see with, with collaboration, we can enhance what the library offers. Thank you. And Adios Pierre. Well, I believe the library is a good resource for Walton. I used it in the past and I still continue to use it, my kids. Let me tell you about books, textbooks are very, very expensive. Some people go to school, they can't even afford to buy the books. They use the library as a good tool to do research, uh, to make copies, to go online. And I agree with uh, Moses, not everybody has uh, access to a computer. You have to go to the library. and some. Some parents, they go, they go to work to, to care for their family, and they also are, have to go to school. Sometimes they need a quiet place to, to do their homework. The, I believe the library is a good place. So I believe the library is good for Brockton, and we need to work together to find the resources to keep them open, to cut and paste, like to take some money, some places to let the libraries open in Brockton. I know there, is three, uh, there are three branches, one in the west, one in the east, and the main library. And I, I know Mark, you mentioned that a lot. Last time I was talking to you, you mentioned it to me. Yes, library is, is a good tool. 
the same way we need public safety, the same way and we need police officers, we need, we need ambulance, fire, fire department, we also need the library for the city. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for indulging me on that. It's my, my pet, one of my two pet topics. Um, we're going to go right to the closing statements because I got the, got the cue, and we're going to go in the order that we drew. So first up for a minute is Shana Barnes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you to the studio. Thank you to the crew, everyone here, my colleagues, my friends in government. Thank you for uh, allowing us to, to come today and to address uh, you, the public, one more time. November 3rd is a very, very important election, not only the council at large uh, election, but there are several other contests in the area where you live. Um, I would ask that as a resident and as a voter that you um, become more educated in the issues. Find out who shares your particular view and your perspective. Fi talk to them. Call them. We've all set up here that we are available. Take us up on that. Make sure that you contact us. As your current city councilor at large, um, I, I've had an amazing time being a public servant and serving uh, you, my, res my friends, my family, the residents of Brockton. And I look forward to doing that again. On November 3rd, I will be number one on your ballot. My full name will be there, Shana Marie Barnes, like it has been in the past. And I ask that you, um, you feel free to contact me. My information is available on the city website. Um, and if you have any further questions for me, uh, please feel free to contact me, Shana Marie Barnes, number one, November 3rd. Thank you. Okay, next would be Robert Sullivan. Well, first of all, good evening, and thank you for watching this, and I'm going to urge you and, and plead to you to, to, on November 3rd, go out and vote. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You can vote for four councils at large. I'm asking respectfully and humbly for one of you four votes on that day, November 3rd, uh, Robert F. Sullivan. I'm going to be number three on the ballot. Uh, born in Brockton, uh, Brockton educated. Uh, my wife, Maria Louise, of 12 years, uh, Brockton gal. We're raising our three kids here in the city of Brockton. Uh, Brockton is home. It's my home. It's your home. It's our home. You need to have the right people at City Hall right now during tough economic times. People that aren't afraid to, uh, to really bang their fists down for the people. And I've done that for 10 years. And I'm asking for two more years because this mission isn't over for me. I want to continue to better Brockton for you and for your family. Uh, I want to be your voice. I have for 10 years and I want to continue to do that. Uh, people have always said to me, why didn't you move out of Brockton? Because I don't want to. Brockton is home. I love Brockton. And I want to continue Continue to be a counselor at large serving you and, uh, and making it all inclusive for everybody. So again, on November 3rd, if you're a Democrat, Republican, unenrolled, independent, please go to the vote and vote for Robert Sullivan, counselor at large, number three on the ballot. ElectRobertSullivan.com is my website. Thank you. Thank you. Next would be <coughs> Moses Rodriguez. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kevin, for doing this. And thank you, the uh, folks here in the studio and you, the voters in the city of Brockton. I mean, you hear promises all the time. I mean, sometimes it sounds like uh, candidates for city council are running for the president or the governor of the state, but that's not, that's not what we're doing. We're, rep we're running to represent you and your interests here in the city of Brockton. Our city has some city problems. We can't change the fact that we're a city. We're a city of 100,000 plus people, and we've got city problems. We're not Avon South. We're the city of Brockton. But it's, a pro it's problems that we as Brocktonians can resolve. And we're the only ones who can actually do that. We've talked about throwing uh, money and, and officers, police, at the, at the issue of crime. But I believe that it's an issue that can only be resolved by Brocktonians working together alongside our police. We've got some serious issues. We'll continue to have serious issues. But we need the, the right people in the right places to fight those issues and to represent you and your interest. You don't need rubber stampers and people that are going to go to City Hall and just rubber stamp everything that's said. I am number two in the ballot on November 3rd, and I'm counting on your vote to go back and represent your interests in the City Council. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Moses. Uh, next would be at SPA. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Brockton, you heard all the candidates tonight, but on November 3rd, you have to make a choice. You're going to vote not because my name is Ajis Pierre, but because I have an agenda and platform for Brockton. I've been living in Brockton for more than 20 years, and I'm here to fight for Brockton. I'm here to fight for your children to be safe in the street. I'm tired to see Brockton, number two, on safe city in Massachusetts. We can change it together. We can have worked on city of champions again. The but only way it can happen if you go on November 3rd, you vote for the most qualified people. 
I'm humbly asking you for your vote on November 3rd. I'm number seven on the ballot. Please give me a chance to serve you. Do, do your homework. Evaluate every candidate tonight. But I'm telling you, I'm, I'm asking you, please give me a chance because I'm here to fight for you, to fight with you, and to have a better work done. Thank you. Have a good night. I'll see you at the City Hall. Bye bye. Win Farwell. November 3rd is not your ordinary election. November 3rd is an election for the future of Brockton and what type of future we'll have. We have a lot of problems that need to be addressed in a team effort. I've served as mayor for four years. As I mentioned earlier, just before I took office, the city was almost bankrupt and we laid off police and firefighters and teachers. When I left office, we had a $7 million surplus and we had rehired the police officers and firefighters and most of the teachers. Please vote on November 3rd because together we can make a difference. Ask yourself among all of the candidates here, who is best equipped? Who has the experience and who has the training and who has the knowledge to really tackle the issues that are ahead of us in this city? And if you believe that's me, with great humility, I ask for your vote because I'd like to go back to work for you. I have great respect for all of my fellow candidates, but I do think that my background is unique because of the honor that you have bestowed upon me in the past to hold office and to be a part of city government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wynn. Uh, next would be Craig Pina. <clears throat> thank you, BCA, uh, for holding this, this uh, forum for us. Uh, thank you to the people of Brockton for watching this, uh, this forum. Um, November 3rd, yes, Brockton is, is, in a, is at a crossroads. November 3rd will be a very important election, and I'll ask you humbly for your vote for Councillor at Large uh, for the City of Brockton. We're at a crossroads right now where we, we, we need the correct people in place to, do, to guide the city forward. I just want to let you know that, that uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, if elected, I will be the city councilor who is there for, for you as a homeowner to help increase your property values. I'll be there for your, for your children to ensure that Brockton Public Schools maintain their, 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 st their, quality, their quality and excellence. I'll be there to help make our, st our streets safe by, by increasing community policing programs and working with, with the community to in increase public safety. Most of all, I'm not going to be anybody's rubber stamp. I will tell a lot of people like, like it is. I'm not going to give you answers just because it's what you want to hear. I'll give you answers that I believe are right for the city of Brockton. When it comes down to it, I believe that your job, your house, your children, and our community are more important than my job as a city councilor at large. I'm going to be the, the, the councilor who tells it like it is. Please vote for Craig Pina, number eight on the ballot, on November 3rd. Okay, next would be Susan DeCastro. Well, first of all, thank you, citizens of Brockton, for watching this broadcast. And if you're watching a taped version, thanks for watching that as well. My name is Susan DeCastro. My name will be listed sixth on the ballot on November 3rd. Please vote. And I'd love you to vote six for Susan. Um, I'm a 25-year resident of the city of Brockton. My husband, John Tuig, his family's been here forever. He and I are raising two sons in Brockton, and we're proud to say we're Brockton residents. We could have lived anywhere, but we chose to live in Brockton. And I pledge to represent everyone in Brockton. You know, there's so much that's good about Brockton. This evening, we spent quite a, quite a bit of time talking about our shortcomings, our problems, our challenges. There's so many lovely neighborhoods. The people are terrific. We have parks and recreation opportunities here that so many cities would kill for. Um, we have a long history of innovation. I think we can, we can do better, and I hope you'll choose me. Vote for me, and I will do better for Brockton. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Gary Keith. <coughs> Mark and Kevin, thank you again for hosting this forum for us. Uh, folks, I'm asking you for your vote. Uh, my name is Gary Keith, Sr. I'm number fifth on the ballot here in November. My wife, Kathy, and I have been married for over 29 years, and we've raised our family uh, of seven here in the city for over 25 years here. Um, I have an extensive background in law enforcement. I've, I'm also a U.S. Army veteran. I've been serving in ministry or in some 
capacity of work for over 40 years, and I'm asking you uh, to help me serve you now. I sit on the planning board and the zoning board right now, and you heard me say in one of our last debates that I am Brockton. What that means basically is that I've, uh, a lot of people have wore a lot of, a lot of hats. I've wore, walked in a lot of shoes. I've been homeless. I've been unemployed. I've made good money. I've uh, been in the food pantry. I've been on food stamps. I've been on welfare. I can relate to every person within the city of Brockton. And I ask you right now to vote for me on November 3rd, number 5th on the ballot. My name is Gary P. Key, Sr. Vote for someone that understands where you've been. Thank you. Well, thank you all to all eight candidates for Councilor at Large. You get four, four choices for Councilor at Large on November 3rd. Kevin, thank you for your help, Absolutely. as usual. And uh, thank you all for being willing to serve. Um, you're watching Brockton Community Access. Stay tuned for more candidates and issues dealing with the City of Brockton 2015 election. Thanks for joining us.